What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hello, welcome back, my lovely listeners. This is episode 11 of the Illumination Hour with me, your host, Ellen. And last week, we ended the show on personhood with kind of a cliffhanger. I said that I was going to carry on that topic into this week. And look at this, the prophecy is coming true. (laughs) This week, I want to get more specific, dig in deeper into things the discussion that we began last episode, when we began talking about personhood. How do you define it? What is it? And maybe some different ways we can view what a person is. Well, this week, I want to go into some of the most hotly debated discussions involving personhood. And I think some of you have probably heard of these before, um, at least in passing. If not, you're very familiar with them, in which case, good for you. But I think there are a lot of people out there that haven't really stopped to give this some thought, mostly because it's just such an unusual topic. I mean, how often do you call into question the entire moral community around you? For some of us, it's more often than others, but that just means that we need to give ourselves a reminder every now and then. Everyone slips up sometimes, and we all just need to be there to support each other and share our wisdom and knowledge. So I'm just going to jump right into the discussion now, since this is part two of an ongoing investigation into what persons are. Let's talk about companies and corporations. When did they become people? Are they people? The U.S. Supreme Court says that they are, at least sometimes. And in the past couple years, the court has dramatically expanded corporate rights. It ruled that corporations have the right to spend money in candidate elections, and that some for-profit corporations may, on religious grounds, refuse to comply with a federal mandate to cover birth control in their employee health plans. These are personal rights that are being afforded to corporations. To many, the concept of corporations as people seems really strange, to say the least, but it's not a new idea. A corporation, according to the dictionary, is a number of persons united in one body for a purpose. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Corporate entities date back to medieval times, Columbia law professor John Coffey, an author on corporate law, says that you can think of the Catholic Church as probably the first entity that could buy and sell property in its own name. Having an artificial legal persona is especially important to churches, says Elizabeth Pullman, an associate professor at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Having a corporation would allow people to put property into a collective ownership that could be held with perpetual existence. So it wouldn't be tied to any one person's lifespan or subject necessarily to laws regarding inheriting property. You can see the advantages in some of these agreements that corporations have and the ways that they've been treated by legal precedent over the course of history. As time went on, in the United States and elsewhere, the advantages of Incorporation were essential to efficient and secure economic development. Unlike partnerships, the corporations existed continuously even if a partner died. There is no unanimity required to do something. Shareholders were also safe from being sued individually. Only the corporation as a whole can be sued. 
So investors only risk as much as what they put into buying their shares. By the 1800s, incorporation and the process behind it became a lot simpler. But corporations are not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution, which leaves the courts to determine what rights corporations have and which corporations have them. After all, Coca-Cola and the NAACP and the National Rifle Association, along with churches and local nonprofits, these are all corporations. All of these truly different types of organizations might come under the label corporation, Pullman observes. And so the really difficult thing is to figure out how to treat these different things under the Constitution. In the early years of this wonderful republic that is the United States, the only rights given to the corporation was the legal right to have their contract respected by the government. The great industrialization of the United States in the 1800s, however, intensified companies' need to raise money. So companies are expanding, they're growing at an ever-increasing rate, they're looking for more labor, and more importantly, more capital. They need more and more. How do they do this? Corporations. With the invention of the railroad, you need a great deal of capital to exploit its purpose, Columbia Professor Coffey says. And only the corporate form offered limited liability, easy transferability of shares, and continued perpetual existence. On top of this, the end of the Civil War and the adoption of the 14th Amendment provided an opportunity for corporations to seek further legal protection, says Moglin, also a Columbia University professor. So essentially the 14th Amendment is the one that addresses citizenship rights and equal protection of the law. It was proposed in response to issues related to former slaves following the American Civil War. From the moment that 14th Amendment was passed in 1868, lawyers for corporations, particularly railroad companies, wanted to use that 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection to make sure the states didn't unequally treat corporations, says Moglen. Nobody was talking about extending to corporations the right of free speech back then. What the railroad sought was equal treatment under state tax laws and things like that. They were more concerned about the money side than about the actual right side. The Supreme Court, of course, extended that protection to corporations, and over time also extended some, but not all, of the rights guaranteed to individuals in the Bill of Rights. The court ruled that corporations don't have a right against self-incrimination, for instance, but they're protected by the ban on warrantless search and seizure. Otherwise, as the Cato Institute Ilya Shapiro puts it, the police could storm down the doors of some company and take all their computers and their files. But after 100 years, corporations were not given any constitutional right of political speech. In fact, pretty much the opposite. In 1907, following a corporate corruption scandal involving prior presidential campaigns, Congress passed a law banning corporate involvement in federal election campaigns, which was held firm and steady for a good 70 years. The first crack in that foundation came in a case that involved neither candidate elections nor federal law. In 1978, a sharply divided Supreme Court ruled for the first time that corporations have a First Amendment right to spend money on state ballot initiatives. And so goes our political system. Still, for decades, candidate elections remain free of direct corporate influence under federal law. Supposedly. But what do you think really happens when there's a large conglomeration of persons that have millions and millions of dollars to blow on changing laws in their favor? Do you really think they stay out of politics? Do you really think that elections remain free of corporate influence? In 2010, the Supreme Court's 5-4 First Amendment decision extended to corporations for the first time full rights to spend money as they wish in candidate elections, federal, state, and local. The decision reversed a century of legal understanding 
unleashed a flood of campaign cash and created a crescendo of controversy that continues to build today. Well, don't you think it's fair? Don't you think that our society should question that? Corporations getting into politics? Of course they're going to have much more influence than individuals. It thrilled many in the business community, of course. They were so excited to be able to form and mold new laws with their new politicians and lobbyists by their side. They were horrified campaign reformers and provoked considerable mockery in the comedian class. But there are also serious people on both sides of the issue. Cato's Shapiro sees all corporations when they spend on political campaigns as merely associations of like-minded people. Nobody is saying that corporations are living, breathing entities or that they have souls or anything like that, he says. This is about protecting the right of the individuals that associate in this way. Right, so corporations can commit all sorts of fraud as long as they can afford to pay for it. It's okay. Countering that argument are those who say that individuals are perfectly free to give money to candidates with whom they agree and to spend unlimited amounts independently supporting those candidates. They don't need a corporation to express themselves. So why is it then that corporations are allowed to spend money on politics? Oh, because it's money. Obviously, everybody wants the money. It's all about the money. Some critics, like Pullman, see a difference between for-profit and non-profit corporations. A non-profit corporation formed to advance particular political views is one thing, she says. A large for-profit corporation is something else entirely. There's no reason to believe that the people involved, shareholders, employees, even the directors or managers, have come together for an expressive purpose related to anything other than really what the business is doing, she argues. And shareholders and employees, Pullman observes, have no real recourse if they disagree with how corporate money is spent in campaigns. You're just a cog in the system. You can't change the system. And then, there is the money is not speech argument. The problem for First Amendment believers arises not because they think corporations shouldn't have rights, so much as they think that money isn't equal to speech. That's true. When it comes to the corporate world, money speaks louder than words. And now constitutional rules are used to strengthen these corporate powers in a way that changes our democracy. That is not how the Supreme Court majority sees their decision, of course. They would never do anything wrong. The court has said that because speech is an essential mechanism of democracy, the First Amendment forbids discrimination against any class of speaker. It matters not, the court said just this year, that some speakers, because of the money they spend on elections, may have undue influence on public policy. What is important is that the First Amendment protects both speech and speaker, and the ideas that flow from each. Well, that is a very good point, that all people of all classes should be allowed freedom of speech, and that nothing should impede on that. They should be able to say whatever they want. And I'm not saying that it's entirely wrong that corporations give money to political candidates either. I mean, if businesses and individuals are allowed to do that, corporations are just a small step away from that. A small, you know, couple billion dollars away from individuals. The thing is, though, that the whole system with politics, it's just ripe with opportunities for people to become corrupted. And the thing that corrupts people the most, of course, is money. Or maybe it's the greed that makes them chase the money. Either way, this certainly isn't good for any of us, except for those that are working for the corporations and for the political entities that are getting the buyouts. So what is the argument against corporate personhood? Well, it comes down to three basic things. Their entity status, their perpetual duration, and their limited liability. I'm going to reference an article here from thelibertarianstandard.com written by Stephen Kinsella. 
In this article, he says that each of these three corporate features pointed to as state-granted privilege can be created purely by private contract. As for entity status, such as being able to represent the firm in lawsuits for property ownership purposes in the firm's name, this is just a convenient legal fiction that could be created by means of trustees or other contractual techniques, including agreements with private defense agencies, insurance companies, arbitral agencies, and the like. In any case, even stripped of this procedural convenience, firms could still organize themselves as joint stock companies or corporations. As for perpetual duration, this can be achieved easily by means of continuity agreements and the like, things that aren't exactly privileges granted by the state. And finally, the big objection to corporations is the limited liability for shareholders. Now, let's mention that many non-attorney critics of this notion seem confused about what it means, and they think the doctrine insulates certain people from liability, even if they're negligent, so long as they're a shareholder. Or the doctrine somehow exempts managers and officers of the corporation from liability. But this is wrong. The doctrine merely says that shareholders are not jointly and severally liable for the debts of the company that they have a share in. If somebody owns shares in a company and that company is sued and driven to bankruptcy, the person investing loses the value of his shares but is not personally liable for the lawsuit against the company. So, sure, you can get some of the benefits of being a corporation from non-state-granted rights and privileges, but does that mean that it's right for corporations to become involved in politics? Perhaps the main question is that because that's what corporations get involved in that changes so much of our world. Perhaps the problem isn't that the state has granted them these rights. If they could get them themselves without the state's help, then that's great, that's fine. But the problem is they're influencing the political landscape in a way that it would take individuals decades to do. And it's allowing for bad laws to pass faster. There is a good point raised about the entity status, perpetual duration, and limited liability. It is a good argument that Kinsella brings up. But there is more involved in corporate personhood than meets the eye. Although I will leave that to you, listeners, to decide on for yourselves. Because for now, we need to move on to the next group of persons or non-persons that is in debate. The question of the embryo's moral status. Now we're talking about human embryos, of course. I don't think anybody is really debating whether dog embryos are persons or not persons. At least not yet. Here I'm going to be referencing an article from the Bioethica Forum. The embryo's moral status is a hotly debated question. Some authors give the embryo the same status as that of adults, while others consider it more akin to things or living beings such as animals. The difficulty lies in that although an embryo will sometimes become an adult human being, they're not already one. To shed some light on this vexing topic, it is necessary to go back to the notion of moral status and examine the way in which we attribute it to human beings. We sometimes deem that a being's moral status depends on its intrinsic value, and that its intrinsic value depends on its intrinsic properties. The relevant intrinsic property for an adult human being is the possession of reason, and this property confers to its bearer the status of a person. So, is the embryo a person? The answer depends on the meaning we give to the expression to possess reason. Is it an actual or dispositional property? If it is a disposition, is it an actual one or a future-oriented potential one? The examination of the notion of a disposition gives a stronger support to the thesis that an embryo may not be a proper person but rather, a potential one. 
So what is moral status? Well, during the debate on pre-implantation genetic diagnostic in the Swiss parliament, several opponents argued that cells taken from an embryo for testing should be considered equivalent to an embryo, a fully developed proper embryo. The reason they give is that each cell is tortipotent, which is a fancy word, meaning it's an immature cell capable of giving rise to any cell type or a complete embryo. So these cells supposedly should be treated as human beings. And as such, the pre implation genetic diagnostic thus constitutes an unethical instrumentalization of human beings. But is that really the case? Is such a cell, even one that's capable of growing into an embryo, the moral equivalent of an embryo? And if it is, is an embryo a kind of entity that is unethical to instrumentalize? According to philosopher Mary Warren, to have moral status is to be morally considerable or to have moral standing. It's to be an entity toward which moral agents have or can have moral obligations. If an entity has moral status, then we may not treat it in just any way we please. So, if an entity doesn't have moral status, we can do whatever we want to it. It's no longer the case if it possesses moral status. As these debates on abortion and embryonic stem cells show, for most people, human embryos do have moral status. If this were not the case, questions about an embryo's fate would not even be raised. However, as these same debates also show, there is no agreement on the kind of moral status the embryo possesses. It's all over the board. So, there are several sorts of moral statuses. How can we describe and determine them? This amounts to asking, what gives moral importance to entities that possess moral status? Well, we can give a simple answer for this. Their moral status depends on certain intrinsic moral properties. Let's go over an example. In our relations with non-human animals, we often ask ourselves how we should treat them and if our attitude toward them should be different from our attitude towards our fellow humans. To answer this question, we point to animals and human beings with different relevant intrinsic properties. These properties are identified on the basis of several things, such as to be in pain, to feel hunger, to be excited or feel fear, or more advanced concepts such as wanting to secure justice. Summarizing the point nicely, to be an astute judge of character, or to be a smug hypocrite. Some of these predicates can be applied to conscious non-persons like dogs, such as feeling pain or hunger or fear, whereas some other more complex things, such as wanting to secure justice or judging character, they presuppose the possession of a conceptual scheme and the capacity to act as a moral agent. This latter capacity is the primary distinguishing feature of personhood, for persons are only conscious entities who can adopt moral attitudes toward moral objects. Now, what I've just stated is the opinion of the article that I'm referencing now. Later on in this episode, I'm going to be talking more about animals and non-humans. Are they persons? How far can that debate take us? Here, I was just referencing a traditional argument between human and non-human, person versus non-person. This is the opinion that's been held for quite a while. So, in short, the moral status of beings depend on what they intrinsically are, respectively beings with properties sustaining simple feelings and stimuli, and beings with more complex, reasonable capabilities. Entities of this last sort being called persons. So back to the embryo. To outline its moral status, we need to determine its relevant intrinsic properties. What makes it morally important? Some people believe that personhood is linked to the potential to become an adult human being. But is potential a relevant property? Before answering this question, we need to dig a little bit further into the concept of moral status. 
let's talk about two famous philosophers and their views on personhood, Aquinas and Kant. For Aquinas, a person includes in its meaning the most dignified nature, reason. For Kant, conceptual self-consciousness confers dignity to its bearer and gives him the moral status of a person, that is, of an entity completely different from things, a thing being an entity that we can use as we please. But their agreement ends when they put forth the question of the moral status of entities that are not persons. For Kant, if you are not a person, you are a thing. An entity can be instrumentalized without restraint, although cruelty to animals is prohibited on different grounds. For Aquinas, there exists a continuum of status following the scale of beings. Minerals, plants, animals, human beings, angels, and God. For our topic, this difference is not so important, because when we ask what the moral status of the embryo is, what we want to know is if this entity has the status of a person or not. We want to know whether we must treat it like you and me. Since an embryo develops naturally into a person, the question should be reworded to something like, when does a person begin? So, is an embryo a person? If it is, it must possess somehow some relevant kind of rationality. There are three main answers to this question, typical of three doctrines. Actualism, dispositionalism, and capabilism. So, let's say the relevant property for personhood here is rationality. For actualism, a person begins as soon as she puts rationality into practice, and as long as she continues to use rationality. So, to confer personhood, rationality must be an actual property of a person. For dispositionalism, a person begins as soon as they put rationality in practice and continues to be a person as long as she is able to put it into practice. So, to confer personhood, it suffices that rationality is a dispositional property of a person. For capabilism, a person begins even before they have put rationality into practice, inasmuch as they possess the capability to put it into practice later. So, to confer personhood, it suffices that a person have a capability to be rational, a dispositional, future-oriented property. So let's talk about these a little bit. For actualism, an embryo cannot be a person because it can't manifest any sign of rationality. I mean, it's just an embryo. This position, however, does not stand against objections because it implies that each time we fall asleep, we lose our status as a person. For dispositionalism, we don't lose rationality when asleep because it's a dispositional property, a property that behaves in a certain manner when placed in certain circumstances. So soon we will again begin to reason when awake. However, a person is only a person if they have already put rationality into practice. So a human being is a person as soon as they show any sign of rationality, but not before. Tristram Engelhardt is a proponent of dispositionalism because he claims that not all humans are persons. Not all humans are self-conscious, rational, and able to conceive of the possibility of blaming and praising. Fetuses, infants, and the profoundly mentally retarded and the hopelessly comatose provide examples of human non-persons. That's an interesting viewpoint, one worth consideration. Capabilism goes beyond this and denies that rationality must have already been actualized for anyone to be a person. In this view, a human being is a rational entity as soon as they possess the capability for it. Even if they can't immediately manifest it, it's only because they need maturation in order to do so. In more extreme forms, capabilism asserts that the embryo possesses rationality from the moment of conception. As it's well known, this is the position of the Catholic Church. 
Let's not go into how scientifically ridiculous that is and move on. It's important not to confuse the capabilities that constitute the heart of dispositionalism, and of capabilism with potentialities. Both belong to a large set of dispositional properties, and both often are referred to as capabilities. Strictly speaking, however, a capability is a disposition to do or undergo something, and potentiality is a disposition to become something. In this strict philosophical sense, when we say that an embryo has the potentiality to be a person, or is a potential person, we mean that it has the capability or disposition of becoming a person, and not that it's truly a person. As Robert Elliot says, potential persons are actual organisms with a potential for developing those characteristics definitive of a person. It will later become a person, but is not yet one. Thus, it doesn't have the moral status of a person. This is why capabilists insist that embryos possess rationality as a capability and not as a potentiality. It possesses it now, so it's not the case that we'll only acquire it later in becoming a person. Capabilists say that embryos possess rationality sometime before it's put into practice because it's a capability. The extreme version of capabilism places the beginning of personhood at conception. Actualism and dispositionalism deny this and affirm that the embryo and even the fetus are only potential persons. Some nevertheless consider that this potentiality is not morally trivial. The intrinsic property of becoming later a person confers some value on the embryo and on the fetus to be a potential person. Even if it is lesser one than the status of a proper person, let's call them potentialists for the moment. And it's not important to evaluate potentialism because our present question is: Is the embryo a person? Only in the case of a negative answer will potentialities come to the forefront. So, does personhood begin at conception? Since rationality is a disposition, dispositionalism. And capabilism are the only acceptable alternatives. Which one's the right one? This debate is certainly not new, and since its beginning, a great variety of arguments have been presented for and against each position. Here, we're just going to focus on what is the most crucial point of this debate: the question of the nature of dispositions. It's relatively easy to tell if a certain entity has a certain property. As long as it's an observable one, although sometimes it takes a long, long time and many difficulties before we can observe certain behaviors, a disposition is not observable per se. It's an inferred property, and to be inferred, it must have manifested itself. We know that glass is brittle because pieces of glass have broken. Contrary to appearances. This is not an argument in favor of dispositionalism. If we can't say that glass is brittle before some piece of glass is actually broken, we can say that a particular piece of glass is brittle before it breaks, and even if it never breaks. In the same manner, if we could not say that embryos possess rationality before some embryo has manifested it, we could say that a particular embryo possesses rationality. Even if it's not manifested yet, nevertheless, there is a special difficulty in the case of an embryo. An embryo, as such, will never manifest rationality, has never manifested it, and will never manifest it. As an embryo is a developmental entity, it does not have all the properties it will possess later from the outset, because it acquires many skills later on. So. This is where the difficulty lies. At what point of its development does it actually acquire rationality? To answer this question, it will help us to look a little bit more into dispositions. A disposition is a tendency to behave in a certain way in a certain environment. Glass is brittle, therefore it has the tendency to break when it's thrown to the ground. Glass has this tendency because of its molecular structure. 
So to have a certain molecular structure is the actual property that underlies brittleness. We call such a property a basis property. Basis properties are actual ones and therefore are observable. So what's the basis property of rationality and when does the embryo get it? Of course, none of us really know, but it does seem that it must be something in the brain. We could say that a human being cannot be a person before the brain is in its skull, and that, therefore, the embryo can't be a person. This conclusion, however, doesn't follow because the basis properties and dispositions are situated on causal chains. The brain has the capacity to think, a capacity that the embryo does not possess because it has no brain. But the embryo has all the basic properties that will initiate the development of the brain. Or, in other words, the embryo has the disposition to be brained. The existence of this causal chain supports capabilism. As soon as the embryo possesses human characteristics, it is a person. As Aquinas so elegantly said, As there is no flesh without a soul, there is no human flesh without a human soul i.e. a rational one. As soon as a body is human, and it is a human from conception, it possesses rationality. That is, it's a person. But if it is the continuity of human characteristics that count, why stop at that? Are not gametes humans too? Of course they are, but they're not human beings. And to be a person is to be a human being, or more precisely, a human individual. On its face, this answer seems to be a good one. And apparently, it strongly supports capabilism. In reality, however, it is fatal to this position. We have good reason to doubt the individuality of the early embryo. What is it to be an individual? Is it to be indivisible? An individual dies when it suffers division, but the early embryo does not die when it divides. It twins. Some strategies have been proposed to avoid this conclusion. One claims that before twinning, the embryo is an individual different from the two twins. A third one, which disappears or dies when the other two come into existence. A second one proposes that the original embryo could simply develop twice. So both twins were one embryo during their earlier developmental stages and at some point started developing in separation from each other, a kind of soft death or alternately of cloning. A third way out claims that when an embryo twins, it's not the case that it is dividing, but that it's losing some of its matter, a cluster of cells. Since the separate cell cluster is capable of forming another person, it is informed once divided by a newly created rational soul. Religious metaphysics apart, these three claims are desperate moves. They resort to very peculiar capabilities, more characteristic of plants than of human beings. It's more true to the facts that a multicellular entity capable of growing into a person is not an individual and therefore not a person, especially since removing an embryo from its host or mother kills it. It can't exist on its own. It is not an individual. This exploration of dispositions gives us some good reasons to think that embryos are not people. They don't have full moral status. Therefore, dispositionalism seems to be a more reasonable position. So how can we conclude this argument? What, then, is an embryo's moral status? In passing, it's been said that an embryo is a potential person, because it will develop into a person if nothing prevents it, so an embryo has the moral status of a potential person. So how does this translate into moral importance? Some authors think that it doesn't translate into any. Remember, for Kant and his followers, if you are not a person, you're a thing, an entity that is outside the moral community. 
It's probably not an acceptable position, as we can see with the case of other entities that are non-persons like animals. It therefore seems reasonable to state that an embryo has the moral importance of an entity that will become a person. But what is that? It's not easy to say, but a general answer can still be given to practical dilemmas. When human interests are in conflict with non-human interests, we must perform a weighing of these interests. Living beings have an interest to live and develop. Sometimes our interests thwart those interests. In such cases, we have to weigh them. So what do you think of that, listeners? Do you believe that? Do you not? Hopefully this brings up some relevant questions as far as where personhood begins. Perhaps it doesn't matter when it comes to embryos, because even if an embryo is a person from the moment of conception, let's say, does that mean that it has more rights as a person than its mother does? What's the most relevant piece of information in that case? There's no way that I can settle this debate for everyone satisfactorily, so I think that it's better if I just leave it there with the debate staying open to all of you and move on to the next set of debates that we have to face, which is the moral status of animals. Here I'll be reading an article from the Journal of Evolution and Technology. Decisions regarding the attribution of personhood to non-human animals have implications not only for the rights held by a particular species, but also for the moral obligations of humans as moral agents. Since humans decide which species are accorded moral standing, because we, after all, are on top of the food chain, we need to be aware of our own vested interests in where the boundaries of duty are drawn. This paper argues that simple determination of moral standing is not sufficient to induce relevant changes in moral behavior. It examines six problems that emerge for us in determining the personhood of non-human animals, identifying which capacities we believe to be morally relevant, separating the identification of capacities from the duty of consequences. Designing appropriate methodologies for assessing morally relevant capacities in non-human animals. Identifying relevant claim rights for non-human animals. Resolving competing moral interests among species and between non-humans and humans. And ensuring appropriate moral behavior. The conclusion of this examination is that we have a long way to go in order to be consistent in our moral behavior. Hidden in discussions of personhood is a vested interest that is seldom acknowledged. If we attribute moral standing to a group or class of non-human animals, we create accompanying moral obligations for ourselves as humans. The concepts of morality with which we are dealing are human concepts, not species-neutral ones. Moral considerability in the context of non-human personhood is asymmetrical in that Non-human animals may have moral claims on humans without humans having reciprocal claims on them. Discussions of personhood are not about who is a moral agent. By definition, humans are. Rather, any exploration of moral standing which underlies personhood is an examination of the boundaries of our moral duties to other entities, not of theirs to us. So why do we need to accept or impose any restrictions on our actions? Is the ascription of moral standing to various non-human animals enough to discharge our ethical responsibilities to those other species, or does actual behavior change need to follow? Our understanding of what constitutes personhood in non-human animals determines whether or not we attribute moral standing to those animals which in turn shapes or should shape our behavior towards that class of animals. Both our ethics and our legal system are based on notions of moral standing, distinguishing between two primary categories, persons with intrinsic value and do our respect, and things available for our use without regard to their interests or preferences. 
We apply different standards of conduct and censure to ourselves and others if we believe that we're interacting with a thing, an entity with no moral standing, or with a person, an entity with moral standing. So being a person, or personhood, becomes about having moral status. When we talk about non-human animals having moral status, we are referring to whether or not we feel we ought to. When making moral decisions, take that animal's welfare into account, for the animal's own sake, and not merely for the benefit of ourselves or someone else. Acting unjustifiably against the interests of an animal with moral standings, so as to cause harm to that animal, is considered both wrong, and as wrongdoing the animal. If we examine the concept of moral standing more closely, we find that a non-human animal has moral standing if, when making a moral decision, we feel we ought to take that animal welfare into account for the animal's own sake. The critical words above are "if we feel we ought to." The assignment of moral standing is a social choice, not an inherent attribute independent of human preferences, and reflects an often unspoken set of values. So recognizing how we make the choice to assign moral standing becomes relevant. The concept of moral standing is unfortunately intricately related to that of legal standing. Legal standing refers to the ability of an entity or its advocate to demonstrate that the entity has or will certainly suffer harm from a particular action. The harm is directly attributable to the party engaged in that action. And it is possible for the court to redress the injury, since only an entity with moral standing can, by definition, experience harm or injury. Moral status is a necessary condition for legal personhood. The assignment of legal standing too is a matter of social choice. For example, corporations, as groups of humans or natural persons, have been designated as legal or juridical persons. The law then can, if it chooses, create persons. It's not merely a passive recorder of their presence. Whether or not we want to grant legal standing as a person before the law, this has significant and possibly moral consequences. Matthew Hazel Pan is a case in point. This chimpanzee was abducted from Sierra Leone in 1982 and transported to Australia, where he was placed in a shelter. In 2007, when the shelter threatened to go into bankruptcy and close, friends of Matthew tried to intervene and establish a fund for his care. The Australian courts found that Matthew existed only as an asset of the shelter, and had no legal standing to either receive funds or even to have a legal guardian appointed who could receive funds in his name. The case was appealed unsuccessfully to the European Court of Human Rights. If, however, Matthew were recognized as a person, the damage done to his life would count, and he himself could start legal procedures against those responsible for it. He could sue the animal dealers who abducted him and killed his mother. He could sue the company who paid for his abduction in order to do experiments on him, and he could sue the government of those countries who gave permits for his abduction or for those experiments. All those are responsible for his situation, and all those should therefore be held liable to undo the damages as best they can. Of course, these are not my viewpoints, but this was said in defense of Matthew. Based on all of the scientific evidence available regarding the complex cognitive functioning and emotional intelligence of chimpanzees, Matthew qualifies for moral standing and hence for personhood. However, he faces an Uncertain future because his status has not been acknowledged. I don't think I would want to acknowledge Matthew's status as a person if he were threatening to sue everything and everyone. I don't think that's a good reason for animals to be seen as persons so that they can sue those that have done wrong to them. I think that a good reason for animals to be seen as persons is because animals are living entities with they. Capacity to reason. So the matter of moral standing and personhood is not simply philosophical. There are life-altering consequences. A non-human animal with moral standing is automatically a rights holder 
or a possessor of certain inalienable rights. By inalienable, we mean that rights cannot be given or taken away, though even with other humans, they are all too often ignored. When we think about the possible rights of animals, we're preliminarily concerned with negative rights or claim rights, otherwise rights that automatically impose a duty on humans to refrain from acting in a manner that would violate that right. So, what might those claims be? Again, we humans are the ones who would define them, and they might include things like the freedom from the threat of unnatural death, such as hunting or research, freedom from slavery or being owned by another, freedom from kidnapping, torture or experimentation, freedom from servitude or inhumane treatment, and freedom to live in their own natural habitat. In the context of legal rights, the first four rights listed above are encompassed in the concepts of bodily liberty and bodily integrity. Whether we would want to accord such rights for our companion animals is an illustration of how intertwined our duties as moral agents and our vested interests can become. As a human race, we've been gradually broadening who we would consider to be persons with moral standing such as groups or classes of entities with rights towards whom we have a moral duty or obligation. We generally consider all humans to be persons with moral standing, though that's not true in terms of treatment of the 29.8 million humans currently enslaved around the world. We also have a category of entities that we generally agree are things, such as rocks, shoes, cars, but there is a vast middle ground in which various scientists and philosophers have offered different definitions and framework for defining personhood. The boundary between person and thing is not all that clear-cut. Instead, we experience what phenomenologists refer to as fuzzy sets, or sort of a gray middle area of gradual transition from things to persons. Zade who originated the fuzzy set concept, indicated that such a framework provides a natural way of dealing with problems in which the source of imprecision is the absence of sharply defined criteria of class membership. When we choose to place the boundary line between species classified as persons, to whom we owe a moral duty, and those to whom we don't, is very inconsistent and is often influenced by values, or vested interests. In addition, we are being confronted with a growing set of scientific writings on the unsuspected capacities of a wide range of species. Bekoff has summarized research demonstrating sentience not only in mammals, but also in animals as diverse as ants, spiders, bees, chickens, birds, fish, and octopuses. I don't know if I would believe the thing about the hive-minded creatures like ants and bees having sentience, but this is all still quite skeptical and in the first, earliest stages of study, at least for some species. Denayer expands the list to include a range of invertebrates such as crustaceans, insects, and even flatworms. She concludes that there's strong evidence that all creatures who possess a brain are sentient and growing evidence that all creatures with a nervous system are sentient. Evolution would be inexplicably discontinuous if only humans, only mammals, or only vertebrates could suffer. Again, this brings to question sentience. Does it depend solely on the capacity of a being to suffer, or is it more than that? Embedded in the scholarly literature, though not always explicitly acknowledged, are at least six problems related to that fuzzy area. These can all call into question whether the simple designation of moral standing is sufficient to result both in identifying all those with whom we have a moral duty and in ensuring that claim rights are not violated. The first problem is identifying morally relevant capacities. We humans have been accustomed to considering ourselves unique among species, differentiated by our rationality or complex cognitive abilities. Since researchers began demonstrating that other species, particularly chimpanzees, elephants, dolphins, and whales, are also intelligent as well as self-aware, various writers have suggested 
candidate capacities that could distinguish humans from non-humans. De Grazia has argued that personhood is a cluster concept that serves as a summary placeholder for other concepts such as moral agency, autonomy, the capacity for intentional action, rationality, self-awareness, sociability, and linguistic ability. So, are these the necessary and sufficient morally relevant capabilities? Is linguistic ability, for example, constrained to a language spoken or understood by humans, or is it species-dependent? Could it be a chemically or color-based language rather than an oral or manual-based one? Could that language exist in a visual or auditory spectrum outside of the ability of humans' usual capacity to detect? Taylor has proposed that where it is more than simply a synonym for human being or person, figures primarily in moral and legal discourse. A person is a being with a certain moral status, a bearer of rights, but underlying that moral status is, as its condition, certain capacity. A person is a being who has a sense of self, has a notion of the future and the past, and can hold values, make choices. In short, they can adopt life plans. At least a person must be the kind of being who is in principle capable of all this, however damaged those capacities may be in practice. As we sort through these various candidates for capacities related to moral standing, we can see the focus has gradually shifted over the centuries from rationality to sentience, from intelligence to the ability to suffer or feel pain. We can think of sentience, which is the ability to perceive and feel, as a threshold capacity that distinguishes at the most basic level between those without moral standing and those with it. Without sentience, the argument goes, no harm can be felt, and thus could not have occurred. Is simple sentience enough to confer full personhood with inalienable rights? Probably not. Most likely, it is enough only to invoke a duty of care, in the same manner that we owe a duty of care to infants, or persons with severe developmental disabilities who are not able to make decisions for themselves. Thus, non-human animals with only sentience could be considered as having limited moral standing but not actual personhood. Based on current research, crabs and lobsters would fall into this category of limited moral standing with moral implications for the human food industry. Once past the threshold of sentience, what other capacities matter and how much do they matter? Well, there are three other categories that we consider as worthy of exploration. Self-awareness, agency, including cognitive abilities, and social relationships, or culture. As a test of this approach, we can review the research from a range of different non-human species. The most common way to measure experimentally self-awareness has been the mirror test. Does a non-human animal display behavior indicating that they're aware of the image in the mirror as themselves? The answer is clearly yes for elephants, chimpanzees, and dolphins, and also magpies. However, the mirror test methodology relies on visual cues, which predominate in human experience. There are other species, such as bears and dogs, who rely primarily on a sense of smell, and so would need to be evaluated with a different methodology. More important, though, than a simple self-recognition is being what Reagan refers to as a subject of a life. Does the entity have a sense of continuity over time if engagement in a life process? If the answer is yes, then harm would limit or cut short those future possibilities. A corollary of that sense of having one's own perspective is metacognition, which recent research has demonstrated to occur in chimpanzees. Metacognition is basically reflecting back and thinking about your thought processes or your decisions. Much of the focus of research has been in the arena of intelligence, decision-making, and problem-solving. 
and the compilation of research articles provides ample evidence that elephants and cetaceans are very intelligent, second only to humans. Chimpanzees, along with other great apes, have demonstrated that they are intelligent and good problem solvers, often better than humans at math. Black bears can also count as well as primates. Crows are at the top of the avian IQ scale, as well as being very handy with tools. Even octopuses have been proven to have excellent problem-solving ability, as well as a range of strategies for evading predators, including changing their shape, color, and texture. Wild elephants live in extended matriarchal groups with complex networks of individual relationships. They display a range of behavior to assist each other. When members of their herd die, they engage in mourning rituals. In fact, dozens of elephants arrive at the home of Lawrence Anthony, the late elephant whisperer, to mourn his death. Chimpanzees, too, are highly social and have been shown to starve themselves rather than inflict pain on another chimp. When given the choice, they prefer outcomes that rewarded both themselves and their apparent opponent, as did rats. Orangutan mothers stay with their young for eight to ten years nurturing them, clearly displaying signs of care. Dolphins and whales as well live in highly complex societies with cultural transmission of learned behavior. They also play together, cross species. Humpback whales have been observed helping a baby gray whale in danger from a pod of orcas. Of all the species reviewed, only the octopus is not social. This may be related to its brief lifespan, averaging three years, although we should keep in mind that social capabilities of animals don't necessarily determine their moral status. As this research accumulates, we're finding more and more evidence of a wide range of capacities that humans associate with personhood, which are demonstrated by an extraordinarily wide range of non-human animals. Does this mean that all sentient animals have moral standing? Would we be willing to accept such a broad mandate of duty? Since moral standing is socially determined, one of the complicating factors is that declaring a non-human to be a rights holder results in a limitation on humans' liberty to act. While we may recognize and intellectually accept scientific evidence of sentience, consciousness, complex cognitive functioning, or future orientation, that doesn't mean that we're prepared to act towards that species of non-human animals as we would towards another human. For example, scientists are divided on whether lobsters feel pain when plunged into boiling water, but agree that they do cringe and would certainly condemn plunging a human into water of killing temperatures. The intelligence and social culture of elephants is not open to dispute, though, and still zoos and other owners keep single elephants chained to stakes in concrete yards, separated forever from their family herd a practice that would be loudly condemned is perpetuated on humans. If debates within the scientific community are examined, humans' vested interests are clearly at play. While there is clear evidence of the grounds for moral standing for great apes, their use as things is still of paramount importance to some. The following statement has been attributed to Professor Blakemore of the Medical Council of Great Britain. It would be necessary to perform research on great apes if humans were threatened by a pandemic virus that afflicted only humans and other great apes. Is that true? Apes are still genetically different from humans, and not all things that affect humans would affect great apes in the same way. Our own preferences and habits often intervene and slant the data we receive, so that we can buffer ourselves from any need to change. One of the methods we use is in our choice of vocabulary. Culling has a less disturbing sound than murdering or slaughtering. How can we achieve objectivity or awareness without reverting to vested interests is unclear. We all just have to maintain a firmly rooted rational outlook when talking about animals. Immediately at the threshold of sentience, we run into some difficulties. 
How are we supposed to measure the sentience, or indeed any other attribute of entities quite different from ourselves? For years, we blithely believed that humans were the only species to use tools, until researchers documented that wasps were using pebbles as hammers, octopuses were carrying coconut shells as portable hiding places, crows are using sticks to dig in the ground for grubs, and many other examples. The mathematical abilities of fish have proven to be on par with those of monkeys, dolphins, and bright young human children. It's easy to anthropomorphize and miss what is actually occurring. The 2012 Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness addressed some human biases. Young human and non-human animals without neocortices retain these brain-mind functions. Furthermore, Neural circuits supporting behavioral or electrophysiological states of attentiveness, sleep, and decision making appear to have arisen in evolution as early as the invertebrate radiation being evident in insects and cephalopod mollusks, such as octopi. The absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude an organism from experiencing effective states. There has been a lot of controversy over whether or not fish feel pain, the resolution of which has clear implications for the sport of fishing. One group of scientists has announced that it's not possible for fish to feel pain because they don't possess a neocortex, which is involved in humans' experience of pain. Instead, they assert that only nociception occurs. Nociception, just in case you're unaware, is the sensory nervous system's response to certain harmful or potentially harmful stimuli. It's an automatic thing. It happens without your control. Other scientists assert that they have controlled for nociception, and fish do indeed feel pain, just processed differently than in humans. Similar issues have arisen in regard to the intelligence of octopuses as they rely on a nervous system that is fundamentally different than that of vertebrates. It would make sense that all living things, fish and octopus alike, would need to feel pain in order to have a feedback mechanism from their environment, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to exist and sustain themselves for so many millennia. There are also prejudices that affect our evaluation of the dynamics we witness. Most pervasive is the association of sameness with personhood and a rejection of difference. We more readily attribute personhood to chimpanzees who are structurally similar to us while distancing ourselves from elephants and dolphins who are actually more intelligent and more similar to us in emotional intelligence. As for dolphins, their intelligence, self-awareness, Emotional sophistication and social complexity mean that they are similar to us. But cetaceans, unlike great apes for instance, look and move completely differently, lack changes in clearly recognizable facial expressions, communicate in strange modalities, live in a very different physical environment, and seem to possess a level of social cohesion foreign even to us. Indeed. In the midst of the horrendous annual slaughters in the dolphin hunt drives, dolphins call out to each other in panic and pain, and yet still appear to us to be smiling. Because of our focus on sameness, we tend to measure other species against a human yardstick. We affirm that they have language, if they learn our language, without giving any thought to the fact that our language would be a second or third language for them. We assume, in the design of our experiments, that visual cues are the primary mode of interacting with the environment. We privilege species that use hands or feet, as we do. It's become clear that we need to evaluate attributes with a meaningful context for non-humans in question. Researchers are becoming more creative and less human-centered in their approaches. Dewall has provided some intriguing examples. Because elephants use their trunks for smell, they're unlikely to reach for a stick, as a chimpanzee or human might, and block the sense organ if they can find alternatives to solve a problem. Chimpanzees can tell the faces of other chimpanzees apart, although they might not distinguish as well between human faces. Elephants are also clearly able to demonstrate self-awareness once the mirror being used is increased in size 
to eight feet by eight feet. We need to be careful not to assume that just because we're not finding a capacity, it isn't there. The shortcoming may be our own approach to measurement. There are several other interesting problems that we run into when trying to figure out how it is that we should deal with non-human person rights. But the last one I want to cover today is about resolving competing moral interests. In real life, we frequently have situations where the rights of one group come into apparent conflict with those of another. Given all of the scientific evidence. We can no longer assume that human interests are always most important. How are we to decide then what takes precedence? Up to this point, we've been concerned primarily with moral considerability, or whether a species has or does not have moral standing. But now we turn to moral significance, or how much weight we give to the possession of particular capacities, to which interests are pertinent to moral standing. To the circumstances in which those interests occur, and to the relationship existing between the entities involved. While a detailed examination of how we might value different interests or weigh relationships can be useful, we can point out that these choices are based on our own value hierarchy, and they're intricately bound up with our vested interests. In general, as moral agents, we are expected to ensure that of all interests to be considered, more are satisfied than frustrated. The fact that non-human animals can make moral claims on us does not, in itself, indicate how such claims are to be assessed, and conflicting claims educated. Being morally considerable is like showing up on a moral radar screen. How strong the signal is, or where it's located on the screen, are separate questions. Competing moral interests can occur between any species. In fact, all species compete for resources such as space, food, and water. Most troubling for us are the conflicts between humans and non-human animals. We all know that humans like to destroy the natural ecosystems around the world, as in. The Amazon rainforest currently is being completely decimated in order to plant one particular type of crop that will be useful for us, but in fact will be destroying the habitat of millions of animals. In this sense, humans are extremely invested in their own interests and not those of other animals. Crows, for example, are clearly deserving of moral standing based on their intelligence and self-awareness. Yet they're an opportunistic species and are generally regarded as a nuisance animal. In the U.S., crows are protected as migratory birds, and several species have been listed as endangered. This has not prevented individuals and communities from launching campaigns to confine, kill, poison, immobilize, or harass crows. These questions bring us up against our values. How would we ever decide to privilege a non-human species over humans? Would we ever privilege a non-human species over humans? Highly doubtful. We're far too egocentric for that. But would we ever treat other species of non-human animals with an equal amount of respect for their space as we do with humans? Would there be a reason to? How do we judge ourselves as sentient beings? Is it how successful we are as a species, or is it how we treat those around us that are perhaps less capable, though can feel and experience along with us? Perhaps we don't have an evolutionary responsibility to those animals around us, only because we're more intelligent. But perhaps we do owe them a bit of respect, seeing as It takes effort to exist. You're not just born into this world and you go on living for as long as possible until someone or something kills you. It takes work. It takes courage and skill. You have to find food and find ways of solving problems around you regarding survival and reproduction. This involves a whole cascade of thoughts, of challenges, of judgments. And perhaps some species are quite sexish, but perhaps some species are more creative.
If so, perhaps we have things that we could learn from these species. Or maybe we could work with them in such a way as to learn about them, thus giving us more to reflect on about ourselves. Whatever the case may be, I hope you've enjoyed the show this week. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. This has been the Illumination Hour. See you next week.